I never liked dolls. There was something about their unblinking eyes and fixed smiles that always unsettled me. My sister Clara loved them. Her room was filled with them, each one more lifelike than the last. But there was one doll in particular that always caught my eye. An antique doll with porcelain skin, curly dark hair, and a tattered lace dress. The tag beneath it read, made by Old Man Thomason, 1921. Thomason was a name whispered in our small town. He had been a doll maker decades ago, a recluse who lived on the edge of town, crafting beautiful but eerie dolls that seemed almost alive. The legend went that Thomason's wife and child had died suddenly, and after that, his dolls grew stranger. People said they could hear whispers in the night that Thomason had gone mad, but no one knew for sure. Eventually, he disappeared. Some claimed he had cursed his creations, binding their spirits within them. I thought it was just a story. Until that night, it was fall, and the air had turned crisp. Clara had begged me to take her doll to the attic, insisting that it was staring at her while she slept. That wasn't unusual for her. She'd been having nightmares about the doll for weeks, ever since our aunt had gifted it to her. I laughed it off at first, teasing her for being scared of a silly old doll. But eventually, I agreed. As I picked up the doll, I swear its glass eyes followed me. It was just my imagination, I told myself, though my fingers tingled with a strange unease. Its porcelain face felt unnervingly cold, like touching something that had been outside in the autumn frost too long. I shook the thought away and headed up to the attic, placing it on a dusty shelf among old photo albums and forgotten furniture. That should have been the end of it. But later that night, I woke up to a sound. At first, I thought it was just the wind. Our house was old, and the wind always found ways to make the walls groan. But as I lay there listening, the noise became clearer. It wasn't the wind. It was a soft, rhythmic tapping, like tiny footsteps walking across the wooden floorboards. My heart thudded. I sat up the room bathed in pale moonlight. My door was closed. The tapping continued, slowly, closer. It wasn't coming from outside, it was coming from the attic above me. My skin prickled and I tried to tell myself it was just the house settling, but deep down I knew better. I swung my legs out of bed, my feet cold against the floor. I tiptoed to the door and pressed my ear against it. The tapping stopped. I exhaled, relief flooding me for a brief second until I heard it again. This time it wasn't footsteps, it was a voice a soft, whispery voice. It was faint, but clear enough that I could make out the words. Let me out. My blood turned to ice. It wasn't a dream. The voice was real. I backed away from the door, my heart hammering. The voice grew louder, more insistent. Let me out. I ran to Clara's room, bursting through the door. She was sitting up in bed, her eyes wide with fear. You hear it too, don't you? She whispered. I nodded, too scared to speak. We both heard it now, soft, shuffling footsteps moving down the hall, heading straight toward us. The voice, closer. I want to be free. We huddled together, frozen in terror as the doorknob rattled. Something was on the other side. Something small, but strong. The door creaked open a crack, and there, in the dim light, I saw it. The doll. The same one I had left in the attic. It stood in the hallway, its glassy eyes reflecting the moonlight. I want to be free. It whispered again, but the voice wasn't coming from its mouth. It was all around us, as if the very walls were speaking. Clara screamed, and I grabbed her hand, pulling her toward the window. We had to get out. Now. But the doll moved, quicker than I thought possible. Its tiny porcelain feet clacked against the floor as it advanced toward us. The voice grew louder, angrier. You can't leave. I flung open the window, helping Clara climb out first. We were on the second floor, but I didn't care. The only thing that mattered was getting as far away from that thing as possible. Clara jumped, landing with a soft thud in the bushes below. I was about to follow when I felt something cold wrap around my ankle. I looked down in horror. The doll's small hand was gripping me tightly, its face twisted in an expression that was no longer a fixed smile. Its mouth moved, barely opening, but the voice screamed in my head. You can't leave! I kicked wildly, breaking free, and jumped from the window, landing hard beside Clara. We ran, not stopping until we reached the edge of the woods, the house disappearing behind us. We never went back. The house stood empty after that night, the windows boarded up, the doors locked, but sometimes late at night, people say they can still hear the faint sound of footsteps inside, and if you listen closely, you can hear a voice, soft, pleading, I want to be free. Story of the end. Story number two. I always hated the cornfields near my grandparents' farm. During the day, they seemed harmless enough, just tall stalks swaying gently in the breeze, a golden sea stretching for miles, but at night, 
When the wind blew through them, they whispered. It wasn't the same sound as the wind rustling leaves or branches. It was something else. Something darker. I hadn't visited the farm in years, not since I was a kid. But last fall, after my grandfather passed, I returned to help my grandmother with the property. She couldn't handle it alone, and though I didn't relish the idea of being back near those fields, I owed it to her. It was late October, the time when the fields were full-grown, towering over anyone who dared wander too close. The corn swayed gently in the breeze, casting long shadows across the land as the sun dipped behind the horizon. I watched from the window as night settled in, the temperature dropping sharply. Grandma had gone to bed early, so it was just me, alone with my thoughts, and the ever-present whisper of the corn outside. I told myself I was too old to be scared, but there was something about the quiet of the farm at night that felt wrong, like something was waiting, watching. That night, as I lay in bed trying to sleep, I heard it. The whispers. They were faint at first, barely noticeable over the sound of the wind. But as the minutes passed, they grew louder, more distinct. They didn't sound like words, not exactly. It was more like a murmur, a hushed conversation happening just out of reach. I sat up, my heart racing. I wanted to believe it was just the wind, the stalks brushing against each other. But deep down, I knew better. I'd heard those whispers before, when I was a kid. Back then, I had stayed at the farm during the summer. One evening, just after sunset, my friends and I had dared each other to play hide-and-seek in the cornfield. I didn't want to, but I, I wasn't about to chicken out in front of them. So we went in. It wasn't long before we got separated. The stalks were tall and everything looked the same. The deeper I went, the darker it got, until I couldn't see anything except the faint outlines of the corn around me. That's when I heard the whispers for the first time. Soft, hissing voices that seemed to come from everywhere at once. I called out for my friends, but no one answered. The voices grew louder, closer. I ran, pushing through the corn, my heart pounding. But no matter which direction I went, the whispers followed. They didn't stop until I burst out of the field, gasping for air, trembling with fear. When I finally found my friends, they claimed they hadn't heard anything. But I knew what I heard. I never went into the cornfields again. Now, lying in bed years later, I heard those same whispers. I got up, pulling on a jacket, and crept to the window. The fields stretched out into the night, an endless maze of shadow and moonlight. The wind picked up, and with it, the whispers grew louder. I leaned in, listening, trying to convince myself it was just the wind. But then, something else caught my attention. There, just beyond the edge of the field, a figure stood. At first, I thought it was a trick of the light. But as I squinted through the darkness, I realized it was real. The figure was tall and thin, barely visible among the stalks. It didn't move, didn't make a sound. It just stood there, watching the house. I stumbled back from the window, my heart hammering in my chest. I didn't know what to do. Call the police? Wake up, Grandma? No. She would think I was imagining things like I had when I was a kid. I needed to know what it was. I grabbed a flashlight and quietly slipped out the back door, the cold night air biting at my skin. The whispers greeted me as soon as I stepped outside, louder than ever. They seemed to wrap around me, pulling me toward the cornfield. I hesitated at the edge of the field, my flashlight beam cutting through the darkness. The figure was still there, standing motionless just a few rows into the corn. My stomach turned. It wasn't right. Nothing about this was right. But I couldn't turn back now. I had to know. I stepped into the field, the stalks closing in around me. The whispers intensified, swirling in my ears as if they were coming from the very ground beneath my feet. My flashlight flickered, the beam weak and shaky, casting long shadows that danced in the corn. The figure didn't move, even as I got closer. It was dressed in old, tattered clothes, and its face, if it had one, was hidden beneath a wide-brimmed hat. My breath caught in my throat. It looked like a scarecrow, but I knew better. I reached out with a trembling hand, the whispers now so loud they drowned out everything else. The air was thick with a strange, heavy feeling, like the field itself was alive, watching me, waiting for something. My fingers brushed the fabric of its coat. Cold. So cold. And then it moved. Its head snapped toward me, revealing a face that wasn't a face at all, just a hollow, gaping darkness. The whispers exploded in my head, deafening, suffocating. I turned and ran, the corn slashing at my arms and legs as I tore through the field. The whispers followed, growing louder, angrier. The figure was behind me. I could feel it, its presence pressing down on me like a weight. I burst out of the field, my lungs burning, and slammed the door behind me. The whispers stopped. The figure was gone. 
The next morning, I told Grandma everything. She didn't seem surprised. That field's been cursed since your grandfather's time, she said, her voice calm. People go missing in there. Always have. I didn't ask for details. I didn't want to know. That was the last night I spent at the farm. The whispers still haunt me, though. Every fall, when the wind picks up and the cornfields grow tall, I hear them. And I know, one day, they'll come for me again. Story the end. Story number three. It wasn't supposed to be scary. It was just a weekend getaway, a quiet retreat in the woods, to celebrate my friend Mike's birthday. We were a group of five. Me, Mike, his girlfriend Anna, her cousin Sarah, and our mutual friend Dave. The cabin was isolated, miles away from any town, tucked deep in the heart of the forest. The perfect place to unplug, unwind, and forget about the world for a few days. When we arrived, the cabin looked harmless enough. A quaint wooden structure with a small porch and large windows that let in plenty of natural light. The trees surrounded it, casting long shadows as the sun began to set, but the atmosphere felt peaceful. At least, at first. The trouble started that first night. After we unpacked, we gathered around the fireplace in the living room. Mike had brought board games and we planned to spend the night drinking, laughing, and playing cards. But as the evening wore on, a strange feeling crept into the room. Subtle at first, just an odd sensation that something wasn't quite right. The air felt heavy, thick with an oppressive silence that grew louder as the fire crackled softly in the hearth. It was Sarah who noticed it first. Did you guys hear that? She asked, her voice barely above a whisper. We all stopped talking, listening. The room fell dead quiet. Hear what? Dave asked, frowning. Sarah stared at the window, her face pale. There was tapping like someone knocking on the window. We all exchanged uneasy glances. It was dark outside, pitch black except for the dim light of the moon filtering through the trees. The cabin was so remote that it seemed impossible anyone else could be out there. Still, we all got up and checked the windows, peering out into the night. Nothing, just darkness. Mike laughed it off, brushing away Sarah's concerns. Probably just an animal or something, he said, though his voice lacked the usual confidence. We tried to get back to our game, but the mood had shifted. Everyone was on edge, jumping at every creak of the cabin's wooden frame, every gust of wind rattling the windows. The tapping sound returned an hour later, faint but unmistakable. It wasn't just random. It was rhythmic, deliberate, like someone or something was trying to get our attention. This time, we all heard it. Anna stood up, her face tight with fear. Maybe we should check outside. No way, I said quickly, shaking my head. Let's just stay in here. It's probably just the wind. But Dave, always the brave one, grabbed a flashlight and headed for the door. I'll take a look. You guys are just freaking yourselves out. We watched as he opened the door and stepped out onto the porch, his flashlight beam cutting through the inky darkness. He walked slowly, the crunch of his boots on the gravel path, the only sound in the eerie silence. Minutes passed. Too many minutes. The air inside the cabin grew thick with tension as we waited for Dave to return. Finally, the door creaked open and Dave stepped back inside, looking puzzled. There's no one out there, he said, shaking his head. Not even tracks. Nothing. The tension eased slightly, but the unease never fully went away. We decided to call it a night and headed to bed, each of us silently hoping the tapping wouldn't return. But sleep didn't come easily. I lay in my bed, staring at the ceiling, listening to the sounds of the forest outside. The wind howled and the branches scraped against the roof. But underneath it all, I swore I could hear something else. The faintest of whispers, too soft to make out, but unmistakable. I pulled the blanket up to my chin, my heart racing. The whispers grew louder, more insistent. They weren't coming from outside. They were coming from inside the cabin. Suddenly I heard footsteps, light, shuffling footsteps, moving down the hallway toward my room. My heart pounded in my chest as I listened, frozen in place. The footsteps stopped just outside my door. I stared at the doorknob, waiting for it to turn, but nothing happened. I lay there for what felt like hours, every muscle tense, every sound amplified by the oppressive silence of the night. Finally, exhaustion overtook me, and I drifted into a restless sleep. The next morning, we gathered in the kitchen, bleary-eyed and shaken. None of us had slept well, and the strange tension from the night before still hung in the air. Over coffee, Mike broke the silence. Did anyone else hear footsteps last night? He asked, his voice barely above a whisper. Anna nodded slowly, her face pale. I heard them, right outside our door. Sarah spoke next, her voice trembling. I thought I heard whispering, like someone talking, but I couldn't understand the words. My stomach twisted. We had all heard it. 
We tried to rationalize it, convincing ourselves that it was just the creaky old cabin playing tricks on us, but deep down, we knew something wasn't right. Still, we decided to stay. After all, it was just one more night. What was the worst that could happen? That evening, we huddled around the fire again, trying to shake off the unease. But the air was thick with dread, and no one could relax. It felt like the cabin itself was watching us, like something unseen was lurking in the shadows. And then, just as the sun dipped below the horizon, the tapping returned. This time, it wasn't just a faint sound at the window. It was louder, more insistent, like someone pounding on the walls of the cabin. We jumped to our feet, fear gripping us. Dave grabbed the flashlight again, but this time, when he opened the door, the pounding stopped. The silence was deafening. We all stood frozen, staring at the open doorway. And then, from the darkness just beyond the porch, we heard it. A voice, low and raspy, calling out from the woods. Come outside. The voice sent chills down my spine. It wasn't human. It couldn't be. Dave slammed the door shut, locking it. For the rest of the night, the pounding continued, growing louder and more aggressive. The whispers filled the cabin, swirling around us for a day too many voices to understand. We huddled together, terrified, waiting for dawn. When the first light of morning broke through the windows, the sound stopped. The cabin fell eerily silent. We didn't waste any time. We packed our things and left as fast as we could, not daring to look back at the cabin as we drove away. None of us spoke for a long time. A few weeks later, Mike called to tell me the strangest thing. He had looked up the cabin's history out of curiosity and what he found was chilling. Decades ago, a family had lived there, a husband, wife, and two children. One night, they vanished without a trace. The locals said the cabin was cursed, that something in the woods had taken them. No one ever stayed in the cabin for long after that. Now I understood why. Story the end. Story number four. Every autumn, the small town of Eldridge held its harvest festival, a celebration of the bountiful crops and the coming of winter. It was a time of laughter, music, and community gatherings, where everyone came together to share stories, eat delicious food, and dance under the stars. This year, however, there was an undercurrent of tension that I couldn't shake off. I had grown up in Eldridge, but I had moved away for college, returning only for the festival after a long absence. The streets were lined with stalls adorned with pumpkins, corn stalks, and colorful fall leaves. Families mingled, children ran about with bright smiles, and the aroma of cinnamon and roasted chestnuts wafted through the air. Yet something felt off, like a dark cloud looming over the festivities. As night fell, I made my way to the town square, where the main events were set to take place. The stage was decorated with hay bales and lanterns, and townsfolk gathered around, waiting for the first performance. I joined a group of old friends, sharing laughs and memories from our childhood. But amidst the jovial atmosphere, I noticed a few townspeople standing apart, whispering among themselves, their eyes darting nervously toward the woods that bordered the square. Hey, what's going on with them? I asked my friend Sarah, who had never left Eldridge. She glanced over her shoulder, her face pale. You didn't hear? There have been strange happenings in the woods lately. Cattle going missing, weird noises at night. Some folks think it's just the wild animals, but others, well, they're not so sure. I frowned, a shiver creeping down my spine. The woods surrounding Eldridge had always held an air of mystery, but I had never thought much of it. The tales of disappearances and strange creatures were just local folklore, right? As the festival continued, I tried to push the unsettling thoughts away. The performances began, and laughter filled the air as we sang and danced. But every time the music paused, I could hear the whispering voices coming from the edge of the woods. They sent a chill through me, and I could see that others felt it too. Later in the evening, as the festival reached its peak, the mayor stepped onto the stage, his face somber. Thank you all for joining us tonight. It's time for the annual bonfire ceremony to honor our harvest. Let's gather around and give thanks for our blessings. The crowd moved toward the massive bonfire, its flames crackling and illuminating the night. As we stood around, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was watching us from the dark trees. Just then, a sudden gust of wind blew through the square, extinguishing a few nearby lanterns and causing the flames to dance wildly. Did you feel that? Sarah asked, clutching my arm. Before I could respond, a loud howl erupted from the woods, freezing everyone in place. It was a sound unlike any I had heard before. Deep, guttural, and full of rage. The townspeople exchanged worried glances, and murmurs of fear rippled through the crowd. The mayor tried to calm us down. It's probably just a coyote or a wolf. Nothing to worry about. 
but I could see the worry etched on his face. As the night wore on, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was terribly wrong. The laughter and music faded, and the festival's spirit seemed to wane. I decided to step away from the crowd, needing some air. I wandered toward the edge of the woods, curiosity getting the better of me. As I approached the tree line, I heard the whispers again, but this time they were clearer, more urgent. I strained to listen, and I could make out the words, Help us, please. My heart raced. I stepped closer, my breath hitching in my throat. Who's there? I called out, my voice trembling. A shadow moved among the trees, and I felt a cold breeze wash over me. Help us. The voice echoed again, more desperate. They're coming. Suddenly, the ground shook, and a loud crash rang out from deeper within the woods. Panic surged through me as I stumbled backward, realizing I had gone too far. I turned to run back to the safety of the festival when I saw it, a figure emerging from the shadows. It was tall and cloaked in darkness, its face obscured. My instincts kicked in, and I bolted toward the festival, adrenaline coursing through my veins. I could hear the creature behind me, its footsteps heavy and relentless. I burst into the square, gasping for breath. The townsfolk were in a frenzy, trying to make sense of the commotion. What's happening? Sarah shouted, her eyes wide with fear. I couldn't answer. The creature burst through the trees, its form monstrous and twisted, a blend of shadow and malice. It roared, sending the crowd into a panic as people screamed and fled in all directions. Everyone, to the town hall, the mayor shouted, trying to restore order. But the creature was relentless, its eyes glowing with an otherworldly light, searching for something, someone. I ran alongside Sarah, our feet pounding against the cobblestone as we made our way toward the town hall. The door slammed shut behind us as we barricaded ourselves inside with a few others. What is that thing? I panted, trying to catch my breath. I don't know, Sarah replied, fear etched across her face, but I think it's connected to the harvest. We need to figure out how to stop it. As we huddled together, the whispers returned, filling the air around us. Help us. Find the heart. Return the offering. What does that mean? I asked, my mind racing. I think the harvest festival, she said slowly. We've been taking from the land without giving back. We need to make an offering to appease whatever this is. The creature pounded against the door, shaking the building. We have to do it now, I shouted. We gathered the few remaining townsfolk and raced to the supply shed, collecting fruits, vegetables, and grains, anything we could find to offer back to the land. With the creature still hammering at the door, we hurried back outside, creating a makeshift altar near the bonfire. Please, I cried out my voice trembling as I laid the offerings down. We mean no harm. We're here to honor the land. As the last offering was placed, the ground trembled beneath us, and the creature halted its advance, tilting its head as if it were listening. The whispers grew louder, filling the air with a chorus of voices. Return what was taken. Balance must be restored. Suddenly, the creature stepped back, its form wavering as if caught between worlds. The darkness began to peel away, revealing glimpses of faces twisted in agony, spirits trapped by the greed of those who came before. I felt a surge of determination. We must free them. Together, Sarah shouted. We joined hands, the townspeople forming a circle around the altar. As we chanted our offerings to the land, the creature roared, but this time it sounded more like a wail, a cry of pain mixed with relief. The ground shook violently, and the light from the bonfire flared bright, illuminating the entire square. The whispers became a cacophony, rising in a crescendo, and with one final deafening roar, the creature collapsed into a swirling mass of shadows, merging with the earth. Silence fell, the air clear and crisp once more. The spirits were freed, their essence rising like mist into the night sky. The townsfolk looked around, bewildered, but a sense of relief washed over us. As dawn broke, the Harvest Festival took on a new meaning. It became a time of remembrance, honoring the land and the balance that must be maintained. The whispers in the woods transformed into songs of gratitude, a reminder of the bond we share with nature. I had returned to Eldridge seeking adventure, but what I found was a deeper understanding of community, respect, and the sacredness of the harvest. Story the end. Story number five. I didn't want to stay at my great aunt's house. It was an old, crumbling Victorian on the outskirts of town, the kind of place that always felt cold no matter how much you turned up the heat. But my parents insisted, it was just for the weekend, they said, while they handled some family business. Great Aunt Agnes wasn't exactly warm or welcoming either. She was stern, her face always pinched, and the house felt as uninviting as she did. Every room was filled with dusty antiques, old portraits of long-dead relatives staring down with blank, 
judgmental eyes. But what bothered me most was the attic. The door to the attic was at the end of a long, narrow hallway on the second floor, just outside my bedroom. The first time I saw it, something about it made me uneasy. It was an old door, heavy wood with a rusted brass knob. I never saw Aunt Agnes go in there, and when I asked her about it, she just said, The attic is off limits. That night, I couldn't sleep. The wind howled outside, rattling the old windows, and every creak of the house sent shivers down my spine. Lying there in the dark, I couldn't shake the feeling that I wasn't alone. I kept glancing at the door, convinced I could hear faint footsteps above me. Soft, slow shuffling like someone, or something, was walking around in the attic. The next day, I asked Aunt Agnes if there was anyone else in the house. She gave me a strange look, her thin lips tightening. Of course not, she snapped. This house has been empty for years. That night, the footsteps returned, louder this time. I could hear them clearly above my room, moving back and forth, pacing. I stared at the ceiling, my heart pounding, trying to convince myself it was just the wind, just the house settling. But the sound was too deliberate, too human. Curiosity got the better of me. I had to know what was up there. I waited until Aunt Agnes went to bed, the house falling into its usual eerie silence, and then I crept down the hall to the attic door. My fingers hovered over the brass knob, cold to the touch as if the air around the door was somehow colder than the rest of the house. I turned the knob slowly, the door creaking open with a groan that echoed down the hallway. The attic was dark, and the musty smell of old wood and forgotten things wafted out. I grabbed the flashlight I'd brought with me, the beam cutting through the darkness as I stepped inside. The attic was cluttered with old furniture, dusty trunks, and covered mirrors. I could barely see the floor beneath all the boxes and forgotten belongings. I shone the light around, but nothing seemed out of place. Just old, abandoned things gathering dust. But then, in the far corner of the attic, something caught my eye. A large, ornate mirror stood leaning against the wall. Unlike everything else, it wasn't covered in dust. It was pristine. The glass perfectly clean, reflecting the dim light from my flashlight. I walked closer, my steps slow and cautious. The mirror was old. The frame carved with intricate designs, but it looked strangely out of place among the rest of the forgotten relics. As I stared at my reflection, I noticed something odd. The reflection in the mirror wasn't quite right. At first, it was subtle, just a slight delay between my movements and the reflection. But the longer I stared, the more wrong it became. My reflection didn't blink when I did. It stood still, watching me with wide, dark eyes. I backed away, but my reflection didn't move. It just stood there, staring. Suddenly, the reflection's mouth twisted into a grin, an unnatural, too wide smile that stretched across its face. I froze, my heart pounding in my chest. The reflection raised its hand, slowly, pressing its palm against the inside of the glass, as if it was trying to reach out to me. I stumbled backward, tripping over a stack of old boxes, my flashlight slipping from my grasp. The attic was plunged into darkness, but I could still see the faint outline of the mirror, the grin of the reflection glowing in the dim light from the hallway. I scrambled to my feet and ran, slamming the attic door behind me. My breath came in ragged gasps as I pressed my back against the door, my mind racing. What had I just seen? Was it real, or was my imagination playing tricks on me? I didn't sleep at all that night. Every creak of the house, every gust of wind made me jump. But the worst part was that I could still hear it, the faint tapping of fingers on glass coming from the attic. The next morning, I told Aunt Agnes everything. She listened in silence, her expression unreadable. When I finished, she stood up without a word and went to the attic. I followed her, my heart racing as she opened the door and stepped inside. The mirror was gone. There was no sign of it, no empty space where it had stood. It was as if it had never existed. Aunt Agnes turned to me, her face pale, her eyes hard. You should never have gone into the attic, she said, her voice low. There are things in this house, things better left undisturbed. I left that day, my mind reeling with questions. I never went back to Aunt Agnes's house, but sometimes late at night I still hear it, the soft tapping of fingers on glass, like something is trying to get out. Story number six. It was the middle of fall, and the air was crisp, filled with the smell of damp earth and dried leaves. I had always loved autumn, but this year, something felt different. Maybe it was because I was spending the season working at an old family farm out in the countryside, in a small town no one really remembered. The farm was surrounded by acres of cornfields, tall and dense, stretching out as far as the eye could see. 
It was the kind of place that felt isolated, but I was looking forward to the solitude. The farm belonged to an old couple, the Wrenches, who hired me to help with the harvest. They were kind but strange, especially Mrs. Wrench. She had these long, staring moments where her eyes seemed to glaze over, and she'd mumble things about the field taking what it wants. At first, I shrugged it off as small-town superstition, but every night, just before bed, I could hear her whispering through the walls. It always made my skin crawl. One afternoon, I was working in the barn, stacking hay bales, when Mr. Wrench came over and told me I, I needed to clear a section of the cornfield at the far edge of the property. It was a little unusual since they hadn't sent me into the fields alone before, but I didn't question it. The sun was low in the sky, casting a golden light over everything, and the rustling of the dry corn stalks in the breeze was almost soothing. I grabbed a scythe and headed out toward the edge of the field. As I walked, I felt the ground under my boots grow soft, almost spongy. The corn stalks loomed overhead, swaying with every gust of wind, and the deeper I went, the more the world outside seemed to fade away. The tall rows of corn created a maze, their whispers growing louder the further I ventured. About halfway into the field, I started hearing something that didn't sound like the wind. At first, it was just a faint murmur, like voices carried on the breeze, but then it grew louder. It was whispering, clear and unsettling, as if the field itself was talking. I stopped dead in my tracks, scanning the area. There was no one, just me and the endless sea of corn. I laughed nervously, telling myself it was all in my head, and started swinging the scythe again. But the whispers didn't stop. They were all around me now, rising and falling, like voices just out of reach. They were calling my name. Oliver. Oliver. I froze. My hands tightened on the handle of the scythe. The wind blew harder, and the rustling of the stalks became almost deafening. But mixed in with the rustle were the voices, overlapping, echoing, as if they were coming from inside the corn itself. I turned slowly, feeling my pulse quicken. The rows of corn stretched on endlessly, and in that moment, I realized I didn't know where I was anymore. The field had swallowed me whole. Suddenly, I saw movement out of the corner of my eye, a dark figure moving between the stalks. I whipped my head around, but there was nothing, just the corn swaying in the wind. My breath came in short, panic bursts. I gripped the scythe tighter, every muscle in my body tensing. Oliver. The whisper was louder now, closer. I spun around, and there it was, a figure standing just a few feet away, barely visible between the rows. Its face was obscured, its body blending into the shadows. My heart pounded in my chest. I took a step back, my hands shaking. Who's there? I shouted, my voice cracking. The figure didn't move, didn't speak. It just stood there, staring. I could feel its eyes on me, cold and unblinking. The corn around it seemed to bend toward it, as if it was part of the field, as if it was feeding off the land. I turned and ran. I don't know how long I ran for, but the rows of corn seemed endless. Every direction I turned, the stalks only stretched further, taller, closing in around me. The whispers followed, growing louder, more desperate. Oliver, come back. I stumbled, falling hard to the ground, the earth cold and soft beneath me. I scrambled to my feet, looking around wildly. The figure was gone, but the feeling of being watched hadn't left. I had to get out of the field. I had to get back to the farmhouse. The sun was sinking fast now, the sky turning a deep blood red as twilight set in. I finally saw the edge of the field ahead and sprinted toward it, heart hammering in my chest. As I reached the clearing, I dared to glance back into the cornfield, and that's when I saw them. Dozens of figures, standing just inside the field, their bodies barely visible among the stalks. They stood motionless, watching, their eyes glowing faintly in the fading light. My blood ran cold. I backed away slowly, not taking my eyes off the field, and when I turned around, Mrs. Wrench was standing on the porch of the farmhouse, staring at me with that same glazed look in her eyes. The field takes what it wants, she said softly. I couldn't respond. I couldn't think. I ran inside the house, slammed the door, and locked it. The whispers outside faded, replaced by an eerie, suffocating silence. I didn't sleep that night. I couldn't. The next morning, I packed up and left without a word. As I drove away, I glanced back at the cornfield one last time, and there, at the edge of the field, stood a figure. It waved. Story the end. Story number seven. The autumn air was thick with the scent of decaying leaves as I arrived in the small town of Blackwood. I had heard whispers about Blackwood Manor, a once grand estate that loomed at the edge of town, long since abandoned and shrouded in rumors of hauntings and tragedies. It was said to be cursed, a place where the echoes of the past lingered, where those who entered often did not return. I was drawn to it, though. 
My friends dared me to explore the manor, and with Halloween approaching, I couldn't resist the challenge. I, I parked my car at the edge of the overgrown driveway, the weeds creeping up like skeletal fingers. As I stepped out, a chill ran down my spine, the kind of chill that made you feel as if you were being watched. The manor itself was an imposing sight. Its stone facade was cracked and weathered, with ivy creeping up the walls like a hungry beast. The windows were shattered, their jagged edges reflecting the waning light of the day. It looked as though it hadn't been touched in decades. I took a deep breath, feeling both excited and terrified, and stepped through the creaking front door. Inside, the air was thick with dust, and the floorboards groaned beneath my weight. A grand staircase spiraled upward, the banister ornate but covered in layers of grime. The walls were adorned with faded portraits of the family who once lived here, faces frozen in time, their eyes seeming to follow me as I moved. I shook off the feeling of unease and pushed deeper into the manor. In the living room, furniture lay scattered and broken. A grand piano stood in one corner, its keys yellowed and stained, as if someone had played it long after the music had died. I wandered around, touching the remnants of a life that had once been filled with laughter and joy. But something was off. An undercurrent of sadness hung in the air, almost tangible. As I explored further, I found myself drawn to a door at the end of a long hallway. It was slightly ajar, and a low hum seemed to emanate from within. Curiosity peaked, I pushed the door open and stepped inside. The room was dark, and the only source of light came from a flickering candle on a dusty table. What caught my attention, however, was an old phonograph in the corner. It looked as if it hadn't been touched in years, but it seemed to be playing on its own. I approached it, the eerie tune washing over me. It was a haunting melody, one that felt familiar yet strange, tugging at something deep within me. Suddenly, the music stopped and silence enveloped the room. My heart raced as I turned to leave, but the door slammed shut behind me. Panic surged through me, and I pulled on the handle, but it wouldn't budge. I was trapped. Then I heard it, the whispers. They echoed around me, soft at first, like the rustling of leaves. But then they grew louder, overlapping, forming words that wrapped around me like a cold embrace. Help us. Find us. My breath hitched as I pressed my ear against the door, trying to make sense of the voices. They sounded desperate, pleading for something, but what? I felt a sudden rush of wind, and the candle flickered violently before going out. The darkness enveloped me, and fear gripped my chest. I was about to scream when I felt a cold hand on my shoulder. I spun around, heart pounding, to find a figure standing in the shadows. It was a girl, her pale face framed by dark hair, her eyes wide and terrified. She wore an old-fashioned dress, tattered and stained. Please, you have to help us, she whispered, her voice trembling. Help you? How? I stammered, still trying to process what I was seeing. The music, it binds us here. You must find the record. It's hidden in the house, she said urgently. Only then can we be free. Who are you? I asked, my voice shaky. I was a guest here long ago. The night it all went wrong. We were trapped just like you. You have to find it. Before I could respond, she vanished into thin air, leaving me in the oppressive darkness. The whispers returned, swirling around me, growing more frantic. Find the record. Find the record. I took a deep breath, stealing myself. If I wanted to escape, I had to find this record. I felt my way back to the door, heart pounding, and to my relief, it swung open. I rushed out, adrenaline coursing through me. I retraced my steps, my mind racing as I tried to remember everything I had seen. The music had to be somewhere in this sprawling manner. I made my way back to the grand staircase, scanning the floor as I went. As I climbed the stairs, the whispers grew louder, guiding me. I followed their pull until I reached a room at the end of the hall. The door was slightly ajar, and I could hear the faintest strains of music coming from within. I pushed the door open and stepped inside. The room was filled with dust, but in the center stood an old trunk. My heart raced as I approached it. It had to be there. With trembling hands, I lifted the lid. Inside, I found an assortment of records, all faded and covered in dust. I searched frantically until I found one that looked different, newer, less damaged than the others. I pulled it out and the music stopped. As if sensing I had found what I needed, the whispers turned urgent. Play it! Play it! I hurried to the phonograph, my fingers trembling as I set the record down and turned the crank. The familiar haunting melody filled the air again, and the room around me began to shimmer. The shadows shifted, and I could see the girl's figure materializing again, along with others. Ghostly apparitions emerging from the walls, their faces twisted in anguish. Please, we need to go, she begged. 
As the music played on, the room began to fill with light, and I felt the warmth of the sun breaking through the darkness. The whispers turned into cries of relief, echoing through the room. Then, one by one, the figures began to fade away, a look of gratitude on their faces. I watched in awe as they vanished into the light, finally free from their torment. When the last figure disappeared, the music came to an end. The silence that followed was profound. I felt a sudden wave of calm wash over me. But as I stood there, alone in the now empty room, I realized the door to the hallway had swung shut. I rushed to open it, but it wouldn't budge. Panic began to rise again. Had I set them free only to become trapped myself? Then, the echoes of laughter and joy filled the air. The shadows around me began to dance, the light shining brighter than ever. It felt like I was being lifted, the walls around me dissolving into a bright glow. In an instant, I found myself standing outside the manor, the sun shining down on me. The air felt different, lighter. I turned back to look at Blackwood Manor, and for the first time, I noticed it didn't seem as foreboding. The windows, once dark and shattered, now glowed with a warmth I had never seen before. The whispers had faded, replaced by the sounds of rustling leaves and birds singing. I realized the spirits had been freed, and the curse that had bound Blackwood Manor was finally lifted. As I drove away, I glanced back one last time, a sense of peace settling in my heart. I knew I would never forget the echoes of Blackwood Manor, nor the souls that had taught me the true meaning of freedom. Story the End Story Number 8 The chill in the air had finally set in, and the golden leaves of October fluttered down like a lazy slow rain. I was driving alone that evening, headed to Maple Hollow, a small town nestled deep in the woods. It was supposed to be a peaceful weekend, just me, a cabin, and a whole lot of nothing. My phone had no signal, which I figured was a blessing. No emails, no calls, no distractions. But there was something off the moment I turned onto the narrow, winding road that led into the hollow. The sun was setting, casting long, jagged shadows through the trees. Something about the way the light filtered through the canopy made everything seem surreal. Like I was driving through a dream, or maybe a memory I didn't want to remember. I shook off the unease, reminding myself that I was just tired from the drive. After what felt like an eternity, I finally arrived at the cabin. It was old, creaky, and smelled of damp wood, but it was charming in a rustic sort of way. I unpacked, settled in, and made a fire. The warmth was comforting, the crackling flames soothing. I kicked back with a book and tried to enjoy the stillness. But then I heard it. At first, it was just a whisper. A faint, almost imperceptible sound coming from outside. I paused, thinking maybe it was the wind or the leaves rustling, but no, it wasn't that. It was different, like someone or something was breathing right outside my window. I got up, heart pounding, and peeked through the curtains. Nothing. Just trees and the fading twilight. I laughed at myself, feeling ridiculous. I'd always been easily spooked, and this was exactly the kind of scenario that would get to me. I forced myself to relax and return to my book, but the noise came again. This time, it was louder. A soft, dragging sound, like something heavy was being pulled through the leaves. My pulse quickened. I got up, grabbed the flashlight from the table, and stepped outside, determined to prove to myself that there was nothing out there. The air was cool and the woods were eerily quiet. Too quiet. I scanned the tree line with the flashlight, my breath catching in my throat. The beam of light swept through the trees, illuminating nothing but empty space. No animals, no people, just darkness and trees. But then I saw it, a shape moving slowly between the trees. It was barely visible, just a shadow, but I knew it wasn't my imagination. Someone or something was out there, watching me. Hello? I called out, my voice trembling slightly. No answer. Just that dragging sound, slowly fading away into the distance. My heart was racing now. I hurried back inside, locking the door behind me. I told myself it was nothing, probably just an animal passing through. But deep down, I knew that wasn't true. Something was wrong. Something felt off. The atmosphere had shifted, and the cabin no longer felt safe. Night fell, and the unease only grew. I tried to distract myself with more reading, but every small creak and groan of the cabin set me on edge. The fire in the hearth had burned down to embers, and the shadows in the room grew longer, more menacing. Suddenly, there was a knock at the door. Three slow, deliberate knocks. My blood ran cold. I froze, staring at the door, the sound of my own heartbeat thundering in my ears. Who would be out here at this hour? I hadn't seen a single soul since I arrived. The knocks came again, louder this time, more insistent. I grabbed the nearest thing I could find, an old fireplace poker, and approached the door cautiously. 
My hand trembled as I reached for the knob. I didn't want to open it. Every instinct in my body screamed at me to leave it shut, but I had to know who or what was out there. I yanked the door open. No one, just the empty porch and the darkness beyond. My breath came out in a shaky gasp. I stepped outside, the cool air prickling my skin. There were no footprints in the dirt, no sign that anyone had been there at all. But then, as I turned to go back inside, I saw it. A figure standing at the edge of the woods. It was tall, impossibly tall, and its limbs were unnaturally long and thin. Its head was tilted at an odd angle, as if it was broken. And it was staring right at me. I couldn't move. I couldn't breathe. All I could do was stare back, paralyzed by fear. The figure took a step forward, the dragging sound from earlier now crystal clear. It was coming toward me. I stumbled backward into the cabin, slamming the door shut and locking it. My hands were shaking so badly I could barely turn the key. I backed away from the door, gripping the poker like it would somehow protect me from whatever was out there. For a moment there was silence, but then I heard it again. The knocking. Slow, deliberate. Three knocks. I backed away, eyes wide, heart pounding in my chest. The knocking continued, relentless. It wouldn't stop. I covered my ears, trying to block it out, but it grew louder, more insistent. The walls of the cabin seemed to close in around me, the air thick with dread, and then, as suddenly as it had started, the knocking stopped. I stood there, frozen, waiting for something, anything, to happen. The silence stretched on, heavy and oppressive. I took a step toward the door, my whole body trembling. I had to know if it was still there. Slowly, I reached for the door handle, my heart racing. I twisted the knob, cracked the door open just a sliver, and peeked outside. Nothing. Just darkness. I let out a shaky breath, my muscles finally relaxing. Maybe it was over. Maybe whatever that thing was, it had gone. But then I felt it. A cold breath on the back of my neck. I turned around and there it was. The figure, standing right behind me, its hollow, empty eyes locked on mine. I screamed. Story the end. Story number nine. It was late October. The kind of night when the wind howls through the trees and the full moon casts eerie shadows over everything. I had just moved to a small rural town called Hollow Ridge for some peace and quiet. The locals were friendly enough, but there was something strange about the way they avoided the old farm just outside town. Every time I asked about it, they grew uncomfortable, their eyes shifting nervously, mumbling something about the scarecrow before changing the subject. Naturally, that piqued my curiosity. The farm was abandoned, or so I thought. No one had lived there for years, but it still stood, decaying at the edge of a sprawling cornfield. The scarecrow, they said, had been placed there long ago, and strange things started happening ever since. It was just a scarecrow, though, right? One cold evening, against my better judgment, I decided to check it out. I wasn't one for superstitions, and I figured it would make for a cool story later. The sky was a deep, bruised purple as the sun dipped below the horizon, and a thick mist clung to the ground as I made my way toward the farm. The wind was biting, carrying with it the faint scent of rotting leaves and damp earth. The place looked just as you'd expect, weathered wood, broken windows, and a gate that hung on rusty hinges. But it was the cornfield that drew my attention. It stretched endlessly, the corn stalks dry and brittle, whispering as the wind threaded through them. And there, in the middle of the field, stood the scarecrow. It was tall and ragged, its straw-stuffed arms hanging limply at its sides. A wide-brimmed hat sat crooked on its head, and its face, if you could call it that, was nothing more than a sack with button eyes and a jagged smile sewn onto it. It was unsettling, to say the least. As I stared at it, a strange feeling washed over me, like I was being watched. I brushed it off, laughing at my own nerves, and pushed through the gate toward the field. The cornstalks rustled as I moved deeper in, their skeletal hands brushing against my arms, but I kept my eyes on the scarecrow. There was something wrong about it. Even from a distance, I could tell it wasn't just an ordinary scarecrow. The way it stood, unnaturally still, like it was waiting for something. And then, as the last sliver of sun disappeared and the moon rose high in the sky, I swore I saw it move. Just a slight twitch, its head tilting ever so slightly in my direction. I stopped in my tracks, heart pounding in my chest. I tried to convince myself that it was just the wind playing tricks on me, but when I looked closer, I realized its button eyes were no longer facing the cornfield. They were staring straight at me. I swallowed hard, my throat dry as I took a hesitant step forward. The ground beneath my boots felt soft, too soft. I glanced down and froze. The earth was shifting, slowly, almost imperceptibly, but shifting nonetheless as if something beneath the soil was moving. 
My mind raced, trying to rationalize what I was seeing. Maybe there were animals burrowing underneath, I told myself, even though I knew that wasn't true. I felt the chill of fear creep up my spine, but still, I pressed on. As I got closer to the scarecrow, I noticed something else, something far more disturbing. The ground around it was littered with bones, small, scattered bones that looked like they belonged to animals at first, but as I bent down to examine them, my stomach twisted in horror. These bones weren't just from animals. Human bones were mixed in among them. I stumbled back, my breath coming in ragged gasps. This wasn't just a scarecrow. There was something evil about it. I could feel it now, the malice radiating off it in waves, the air around it heavy and suffocating. And then it moved again. This time it was undeniable. Its head jerked sharply to the side, and its button eyes glowed faintly in the moonlight. The jagged, sewn-on smile stretched wider as if it was mocking me. The scarecrow's body twitched and slowly its straw-stuffed limbs began to move, the old, weathered fabric rustling as it twisted and bent unnaturally. I took a step back and my heart hammering in my chest. Run, a voice in the back of my mind screamed, but I couldn't move. I was rooted to the spot, paralyzed by fear as the scarecrow began to lurch toward me. Its movements were jerky and unnatural, like a puppet on tangled strings, but it was coming for me. There was no doubt about that. The whispers started then. Low at first, just beneath the wind, but growing louder with each passing second. Voices. Dozens of them. Whispering from the corn, from the earth, from the scarecrow itself. They were incoherent, overlapping, but the one thing I could make out clearly was my name. Ethan. Ethan. I turned and ran. The cornfield seemed endless, the stalks closing in around me as I tore through them, my breath ragged and panicked. But the whispers followed, growing louder, more insistent. And, behind me, I could hear the slow, deliberate steps of the scarecrow, its footfalls heavy and unnatural, like it was dragging something with it. I didn't dare look back. I burst through the gate, slamming it shut behind me, though I knew it wouldn't hold the thing back. I ran to my car, fumbling with the keys, my hands shaking so badly I could barely get the door open. Finally, I managed to start the engine, and as I sped away, I glanced in the rearview mirror. The scarecrow stood at the edge of the field, its glowing eyes fixed on me, its jagged smile still etched across its face, and then slowly it raised one arm and waved. I didn't stop driving until I was miles away. The next day, I tried telling someone, anyone, about what I'd seen but the townspeople just shook their heads, their expressions grim. The scarecrow takes what it wants, an old man told me. Always has. I left Hollow Ridge that same day, and I never went back. But every fall, when the wind howls and the fields whisper, I think about that scarecrow. And I wonder how long it will be before it comes for me again. Story the end. Story number 10. I should have known better than to take the trail after dark. The park ranger had warned me. This time of year... You don't want to be out here when the sun sets. Weird things happen in the woods around fall. I had brushed it off, laughing. I loved hiking, especially when the leaves were turning. What could be more perfect? Now, it was just me in the night, the thick canopy of trees blotting out the last light of dusk. The air had a bite to it, that chill you can only feel in October, when the leaves crunch beneath your feet and the wind starts whispering through the branches. At first, the sound of the wind was soothing, like it was guiding me back to the car, but then, but then it started to feel off. The wind was too soft, too deliberate. It wasn't gusting like it should. Instead, it felt like it was speaking to me, or rather, something through the wind was. The whispers grew louder, distinct. Turn back, they seemed to say. Turn back. I glanced over my shoulder, my heart picking up its pace. The trail behind me was completely shrouded in darkness, and there was no sign of the way I came. Everything looked the same, every tree blending into the next. Panic started to bubble in my chest. I had walked this trail dozens of times before, but now it felt unfamiliar. Too quiet. Too still. My breath fogged in the cold, and I picked up my pace. Leaves swirled at my feet, and the wind carried a faint scent of earth and decay. But something else was there, too. Something that wasn't just wind. The whispers were getting clearer, closer. I didn't want to listen, but I couldn't help it. Come. Closer. I stopped dead in my tracks, my ears straining. It wasn't just in my head. The words were real, barely audible, but real. I turned slowly, scanning the woods. Everything was still, too still. Hello? My voice cracked as I called out. The sound echoed, but no one responded. No animals rustling in the underbrush, no birds, just silence. And then the whispers returned, more insistent now. Closer. Closer. 
Something cold brushed the back of my neck. I jumped, spinning around, but nothing was there. My pulse was racing, pounding so loudly in my ears that I could barely think. I needed to leave. Now. I started running, no longer caring about staying on the trail. My feet pounded against the ground, crunching leaves and snapping twigs, but the whispers kept pace with me. No matter how fast I ran, they followed. Closer. Come. Back. I didn't stop. I couldn't. My legs were burning, my lungs aching, but I had to keep moving. I didn't know where I was going anymore, just that I had to get away from those voices. They were everywhere, surrounding me, growing louder with each step. And then I heard it. A footstep that wasn't mine. I froze, the hair on the back of my neck standing on end. Slowly I turned, my breath catching in my throat. At first, I saw nothing but the endless stretch of trees. But then, just at the edge of my vision, something moved. It was a figure, barely visible in the dim light filtering through the branches. It stood still, staring at me. It was tall, too tall, its limbs unnaturally long and thin, like they had been stretched beyond human limits. My stomach lurched, the figure took a step forward and I stumbled back, my hands shaking. My flashlight flickered, casting shadows that danced across the forest floor. I didn't want to look, but I couldn't tear my eyes away. The figure came closer, its face, oh god, its face. It was twisted, sunken, its eyes black hollows that seemed to swallow the light. Its mouth moved, whispering the words I had been hearing all along. Come closer. I backed up, tripping over a root, my heart slamming against my ribs. It kept moving, slow, deliberate, like it had all the time in the world. And then, it reached out. I scrambled to my feet, running faster than I ever had in my life, ignoring the pain in my legs, the burning in my lungs. I didn't care where I was going anymore. I just had to get away from it, away from that thing. But no matter how far I ran, the whispers followed. Louder closer. Come. Back. I burst out of the trees and stumbled onto the dirt road leading to the parking lot. Relief washed over me for a split second before I realized my car wasn't there. The entire lot was empty and the whispers were right behind me. I spun around, gasping for air. The figure stood at the edge of the woods just beyond the tree line, watching, waiting. Come back. I backed away, my entire body shaking. There was nowhere to go, no one around. I reached into my pocket, fumbling for my phone. My hands trembled as I dialed 911, but the call wouldn't connect. The signal was dead. The whispers grew louder, more insistent. My vision blurred as tears filled my eyes. There was no escape. The wind picked up, swirling around me, carrying those same horrible words. Closer. Come back. I looked around, desperate, but there was nothing. No sign of anyone. Just the figure, standing there, waiting. And then, the wind stopped. The whispers faded, replaced by a deafening silence. The figure took one last step, disappearing into the trees, and I knew, deep down, that it wasn't gone. It was just waiting for the next time I was foolish enough to return. Story the end.